Welcome to another video. While trying to solve a different problem, I noticed that it is possible for f of x to be equal to f of a minus x, where a is a real number and x is just any input value that you have. And I was thinking, is this always true? Well, for the concept I am going to show finally in this video, because I used the concept in the last video, but I did not explain it in full. And I saw some comments saying, hey, some of these things were not clear. So I'm going to explain why I was able to use that idea for the video. However, there are many other, not many, there's some other instances that I came up with where f of x equals f of a minus x. I'm going to explain all four instances that I could think of. I'm sure you might have many more instances where this is true. But the fourth one is the main objective. Let's get into the video. So my very first instance that I was able to come up with is if it does not matter what you plug into the function. The function will give you the same answer. f of x is always equal to f of a minus x. It doesn't matter what's here or what's here. Your output is the same. So a constant function has this property. So the first instance. So first case is f is constant. Look, if f of x is equal to k, then it doesn't matter what you change the input into, it is the same thing as f of a minus x. Say f of x is zero. No matter what you plug in, you always get zero. Then f of x equals f of a minus x because this is going to give us k and this is going to give us k. It doesn't matter. That's the first case. The case of a constant function. Okay. There's another case. There is a case in which a function is only defined at one point. Just one point. It means f of x is only true when x is a particular number and no other number satisfies the function. And we can find that point because that point is the point where f of x equals f of a minus x. Well, we can always work that out. Okay, so let's make it case two. Second case. Domain of f is a single point. Okay, and what's that single point? Well, it's going to be this point, and it's also this point. That is x is a minus x, which implies x must be a over 2. Because if you solve this equation, you're going to end up with x equals a over 2, right? Okay, so, so the domain, <laughs> the domain of this function is the set of a over 2. There is no other point involved. This would be true. Because then this would be f of a over 2 is the same thing as f of a minus a over 2, which is a over 2. Okay, this is the second case. The function is defined at only one point. Here, the function is defined everywhere and the output is always the same, which is k. That's another case. There's one more case. It is the case of symmetry, okay? And I partially used it in the last video. Um, let's say you find symmetry about a point. Let's say um, case three. Now, these are not the main ideas that I'm about to share. There's only one main idea I'm about to share, but it's not case three. So if f is symmetric, about a point, 
Okay, so if you have a function that if you go to the left of it and if you go to the right of that point, everything balances out. Just like you have the cosine graph about the value x equals zero or the sine graph about the value pi over two. Okay, so if you look at those graphs, look, the cosine graph just goes this way. You see that? And goes forever. Everything is symmetric about this line. Okay, so it is not for all functions, but you see that in a special case, if you have a cosine graph, because of the symmetry about the, the line x equals zero, which is the y-axis, or if you're dealing with the sine graph, you see it goes this way. Ta-da-da! Like that. If you pick this point, everything is symmetric about pi over 2. Goes to infinity all the way, goes to infinity all the way. Or if you're going from 0 to pi, then there's symmetry around this point, depending on how wide you want to go. Okay? So, symmetry might be a good one. Let's say if f is symmetric about a point, a point, uh, that point in this case would be this point, x equals a over 2, but a point, um, let's say x equals a over 2, then you go in both directions, because in this case, for the case of cos, in the case of cosine, your a is going to be 0, okay, and 0 over 2 is 0 in this case. If it was case, your a is going to be something else, okay, however you want to do it. A is going to be pi. So, um, so symmetry might be about a line, would be great, about a line, not a point, about a line, not a point, line. About this vertical line. So, now all the algebra is gone, all the trig is gone, I don't want to dwell on that because the focus is the sweetest, <laughs> okay. Now, the fourth case, which is the key part of this video, is if f of x is the integrand of an integral, and this also is the integrand of an integral with a certain boundary, then the two of them are exactly the same. I'm going to show you. If I, let's say there is a definite integral that goes from 0 to a of f of x. Then i is equal to the integral from 0 to a of f of a, a minus x. Dx. This is the concept that I wanted to introduce because I used it in the last video that I made. And this was it, that the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sine x, if you remember, is equal to the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sine pi over 2 minus x. Now, because I use the sine curve, I explained that these two are exactly the same, okay? But it does not have to be a trig function. It doesn't have to be sine. It doesn't have to be cosine. It doesn't have to be tangent. It can be any function in the world. As long as it is integrable from zero to whatever boundary you have, from 0 to any a of any function, you can rewrite it this way and then use whatever trick that you want. And that's what we want to see in this case. Because just by the fundamental theorem of calculus, we know that this is the same thing as this for any function. By u substitution, let u be equal to a minus x, right? We know that du is going to be the derivative of this with respect to x is going to be negative dx, okay? 
just to make life easy, let's bring the negative here and this becomes positive. So we say negative du is dx. Okay, nice. Now we need to evaluate u at zero and at a. Look, u evaluated at zero is going to be um, a minus zero, that's a. And u evaluated at a, the upper boundary, is going to be a minus a, which is going to be zero. Okay, so that means the integral that we have here, this integral zero to a of f of a minus x dx can actually be written as the integral from, see the lower boundary when it was evaluated at zero is now a, the upper boundary is now zero, and we're gonna have f, so we got f of u, and our dx is now negative du. We can put that negative here and put du here. But we know this negative can flip these boundaries so that we have this to be equal to, uh, let's just go this way, and say this is the same thing as the integral, because now we can flip this back, so it's zero to a, and this is f of u, du. Do you think that this is the same as this? Now, if you think, no, they're not the same, well, you're not correct because it doesn't matter what variable you use to represent an integral, it's the exact same integral that we have. I can choose to change the letter to x, which is the same thing as the integral from zero to a of f of x dx. So one thing I want you to think about and know is that for any integrable function, if you integrate from zero to a constant like this, you can always shift the argument this way. And the value of your integral will stay the same. Well, you only use this when it's helpful, as in the case of the trig substitution that I did. And that's the purpose of the video. Well, done. Never stop learning. Those who stop learning, stop living. Bye-bye.